So it was 1939, you know this. 85 years ago this month, our church was born. FDR was the president. King Charles VI was the monarch over England. And Princess Elizabeth was 13 years old. You remember that just a couple of years ago when she passed away, it ended, it was really the end of an era. Uh, she lived to be 96. She reigned longer than any other British monarch, 70 years. But the longest European monarch to reign was the great Louis XIV of France, Louis the Great, the Sun King he was known as. He, he reigned for 72 years with his glorious head of hair. He presided over the most magnificent, extravagant court that was ever seen in Europe. And he wanted his funeral to be just as spectacular. So he instructed the court chaplain, Jean-Baptiste Massillon, to do exactly what he told him to do. He was to be there in the Cathedral of Notre Dame in a golden casket with a singular candle flickering over the casket. And all the people were to gather while he li was lying in state. And when the day of his funeral came, Massillon was instructed to come and offer the eulogy. But thousands of people around, all, all else was dark. Everyone peered in as Massillon came up to offer the eulogy. Massillon came over to the golden casket he snuffed out the candle and he said, only God is great. And his words echo forth as an incredible reminder, not just in that place on that day, but it echoes forth in this room on this day for anyone that would think it necessary to idolize powerful people or kings or presidents or the uber wealthy or celebrities that we all need at times to be right sized before God because only God is great and this is a great week to remind us and a great moment to remind us all that only Christ is king and I think that we would do well to proclaim that together on this historic day only Christ is king let's say it together only Christ is king We've heard it today proclaimed from those who are baptized. He is Lord. He's the master. He's king over all things. He's sovereign over us. In fact, Romans eleven thirty six says this. Let's all read this together. Proclaim it together. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Jesus is king today. He will be king on Tuesday. He'll be king on Wednesday. And the government of every nation shall be upon his shoulders. And we trust in him as king, despite what some people want you to believe, there are no political requirements for our faith. This Reformation Day this past week reminds us the only requirement is that we would humble ourselves before the Lord because he alone, through Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone are we saved. And we all know this as God's people and we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount because we want to live as kingdom people in this world. And it's why for 85 years, we have been asking people to come and join us on the journey to know Jesus and his grace extended to us, to lay down your secondary allegiances, to lay down your preferences and give all that you have to him. He's Lord of all. Is he Lord of your life today? As many have proclaimed today, is he Lord and master ruler over your life? Only then will you find joy in this life. Only then will you be able to live the good life that he's called us to. So I, I pray that even today we would recommit our lives to him, that today that anyone who's never received his grace would do so today, because only God is great. But you know, we, we don't need Jesus really to tell us that God is great. Think about it. Most theists would say God is great. The Muslim says God is great, but only Jesus has shown us that God is, is, is small. 
he comes right to where we are. He was incarnate, God in the flesh. If you wonder, does God exist? Jesus shows up and he says, here I am. And yes, I exist. God exists. If you want to know what he's like, he said, hey, listen to me talk to this woman at the well. Watch me as I engage the the ostracized and, and watch how I care for the weakest and the lowest in society. Watch me. You want to know what God is like? Watch me as I restore Peter after he denied me and turned his back on me. Watch me as I forgive you and love you in your darkest moments. And then he would say to us, listen to me. Listen to me as I tell you about how you can live in the kingdom of God here on earth. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to be looking at another passage of Scripture. Everyone now, looking at the Bible, we say it always. This has always been the text for this course, and it's always what we draw from. Um, I want to, uh, while you're turning there, I want to just pause for a moment and celebrate together again God's faithfulness over these past 85 years. You might know, not not all of you know, we have a lot of guests here today or some are new, but in 1939, um, when our church was born, we actually met in University Park Elementary School. It's possible to forget in a church like ours that's been around for so long that there was a time when a small group of people gathered together, uh, just like any church that would begin. We actually met in a White House over on, uh, on Lover's Lane, right about Preston Road. Right before um, our church started, was born, a month before uh, Hitler invaded Poland and World War II began. Imagine that. A new church plant just beginning, a group of people gathering, and there was much going on in the world just like there is today. Within two years, the United States would enter the war, and the church continued on, and God was faithful through it all. And then as we purchased land here on the far north north edge of Dallas, um, God was faithful. We dedicated this land before the Lord and Dr. Howard, of course, was the pastor at that time. But we all know, as I've referenced Stacy, even today, Miss Howard was really the queen who was running the show. Uh, Praise God for her. And many of you know that she lived to be 99 years old, serving our children for decades, 65 years she served here. So I don't know how many of you have served for 65 years, but I would say press on. Let's keep serving. (laughs) Keep on serving the Lord. So the east-west buildings were built first. You might know that. This sanctuary was was dedicated, was, was completed in 1956. Some of you know that my grandfather... Dr. C.C. C. Warren, pop-hop he was to me, um, preached in this spot. I was not yet born, living in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was born and raised, preaching in about this spot right back here um, behind me now uh, on the day that this, this uh, sanctuary is dedicated. Um, and our, our church has, has been marked by this beautiful building and by our, our bell tower and the clock tower and the steeple. But you know, we've mostly been marked by a people who gather here to worship, then go into our communities, to our homes, and into the world to make a difference. Our, our church has marked our city with love and compassion. We have served our city. The, the city of Dallas and our communities are different because we gather to scatter. We gather to go. We've been raising up the next generation to serve our city. We've been planting churches and raising up pastors to serve all over our city. We, while, while politicians are arguing over what to do at the border, we are at the border. Hundreds of you have gone and served at the border to say, we don't know how you got here. We don't care how you got here. We want to serve you and we want to bring you to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we have more groups that are going. A group of us are going even this week Pray for me and others of us going to the Caribbean Basin where we are going to go and and serve, uh, bless, and and encourage pastors that we partner with in a very difficult place to serve. I'll be teaching at at the seminary there, and we're going to raise up the next generation of leaders because that's what we do. Serving defines us. That's who we are. We don't simply gather here, but we go because we're bridge builders we, we are peacemakers, we're grace givers, we're tone setters in our culture. 
as we go from this place to be light in a world that desperately needs it. And so we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Throughout the sermon, Jesus is calling us to higher righteousness, to, to, to something that the world needs to see. And, and so throughout the, the message, really, Jesus says this throughout the sermon. Essentially, um, uh, don't tell me what you believe. Show me how you love others, then I will tell you what you believe. And we see this even today, we come to a section of the sermon where Jesus is teaching us how to relate to one another in difficult circumstances. Listen, with people who are hard to love, he's gonna teach us how to, to uh, engage people who we don't agree with. In fact, people, we don't even understand how they came to the conclusions that they came to. He's gonna teach us how to love people. Could there be a more relevant passage for this week and in this cultural moment that we find ourselves in. So, so today we're going to explore really the one thing that marks us as a church, what Philip Yancey calls the last best word, grace. We're going to talk about how to give grace freely to others as Jesus teaches us how to do so. There's three things that I want you to grasp today that I think we find in this teaching. There's really three uh, portions of this section of the Sermon on the Mount, and it breaks down this way. First, there's a commandment. So he's gonna give us a command. Then, after that, there is an assessment. And then, we're gonna close with a discernment. So, put on your seat belts, because Jesus, once again, he's gonna challenge everything in us. And so I want us to listen and to always apply. First, a commandment that he calls us to. Look at verse one of chapter seven of the book of Matthew. Judge not that you be not judged. Now there it is, I could stop there, full stop. Don't judge. Then he goes on. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus begins with a command, don't judge. Now, immediately, we think, but, but aren't I supposed to evaluate people, though? Aren't I, especially if they're wrong, aren't I supposed to point out that they're wrong? See, we've made this a national pastime. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of condemnation of other people. Right? I mean, free speech. I can say whatever I want to say. Jesus says, not, not if you want to live in my kingdom. No. Because the better translation here is, is, I think Dallas Willard is right. He says the better translation is don't condemn. Because there's always this, this, this condemnation that comes with judgment. Think about it. There's an, there's a, there's an, an element of self-righteousness in every judgment that we make. Jesus says the baseline for the believer, for the kingdom person, don't judge. And many of us have just followed the way of so many in our day who are doing that over and over again. And the Lord says, I want you to live differently. It's going to mark you. We've already talked about how uh, we often can hold others in contempt. That's a word we don't use a lot, is to disregard, to dehumanize other people. It's to, we'd say, diss them, dismiss them, just disregard them. And, and see, condemnation always involves contempt. It always says, you're wrong and I'm right. Now, you're already with me thinking, well, isn't there truth and isn't there what's right and wrong? Yes, and we'll get to that. He goes on to tell us why we shouldn't do this. You too will be judged. Did you catch that? And you will be judged with the same judgment that you bring to another person. He's saying, consider your heart, humble yourself, measure yourself, because your condemnation of another person will come back to you. And isn't it true? Most often, with more fervor, it'll just escalate, and it'll be a law of reciprocity that seemingly never ends. Wow, this is so hard for us. Judging others, again, has become a kind of national pastime. But again, as kingdom people living in the world, we show another way. We tend to judge people based on assessments of just what we see. I mean, if we're really honest today, 
just the mass confession. We've already done it this morning. We see someone, maybe it's, we, we judge people according to their age. We assume certain things about them. And I praise God that we live in, some say, a cross-generational church. I like to say an intergenerational church. We're going to have lunch together today. We, we worship together. We love the Lord together. We serve together. We, we're in a, a multi-ethnic church. We're in a multicultural church. And so we, we don't judge one another by the color of our skin or where we've come from or how we're dressed. We love each other right where we are. But see, we'll do it this week if we're not careful. And maybe you've already done it. You, you've seen that neighbor who put that sign in their yard. And it wasn't the one you were going to put in your yard. And then across the street, that neighbor put that sign. And, and here's what, okay, confession. Wow, I, I thought you were normal. <laughs> right? This is the kind of judgment we're talking about, real life. I thought, I always liked that guy. Yeah, what changed? Your judgment upon them. I thought that guy was smart. You might be wrong. You see, I, I've asked you before, you know, what does it feel like to be wrong? And often we'll say, well, shame, I guess, embarrassment, all those things. But what does it feel like? How about this? That's what it feels like to know that you're wrong. Feeling Wrong feels exactly like when you feel that it's right, if you think you're right. You see, and so we need to humble ourselves, is what Jesus is telling us here. And if, I want to say this, if your political views align you with someone who's not a believer, more than a believer who might vote differently than you, your priorities are off. Your theology is off. So we have brothers and sisters, even in this church, who have different ideas about many things. But consider how you may judge people prematurely. I want you to just let the Spirit speak to your heart. How do you hold others in contempt? How do you, who might you look down on? When every person has been created in the image of God, and, and I, I thought about it this week, if we hold others in contempt who vote differently than us, it looks like we're going to hold about half of America in contempt, Right? regardless of which way you go. And I would just remind all of us, holding others in contempt or hating others is a horrible evangelism strategy. We're to love others regardless. And this is what Jesus is saying. Our intuition can often be wrong. This harkens back to, by the way, the original sin. See, what's happening is I'll be judged. When you go back to the, to, the, um, to the tree of good and evil, the sin was at the heart of it is pride. I will determine what's right and wrong. I will determine what's good and what's evil, not God. And when we enter into that posture, it's just our effort to continue to try to be God. And every time we do it, we go back to the original sin. And we need to recognize that because that's a dangerous place to be. And it's, it, it's always with more fervor, as I noted, that comes back to us. But this, this childish name-calling and what we see in our culture today, we follow a different way. We are a non-combative, even enemy-love type of a people. And people are shocked by the way that we love one another and we love others who disagree with us. And yes, this is countercultural. And yes, it takes a lifetime of practice. And yes, we need the Holy Spirit to do this in us. And yes, we can do this. We can live like this. And I believe that so many of us are doing just that. So let's be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, there's a twist here. Jesus said, don't judge. But now it's almost as if he says, um, but when you do, now let me tell you how to do it. And this is the part we go, oh, good, Jeff, I've been waiting on this part of the sermon. Um, now tell me how I can condemn people. Now show me how to judge people. Watch this, not what you think. Because there's an assessment. 
He brings a commandment. Now there's an assessment. This probably word is probably a little too soft. It's a deep dive, a humble, honest examination of the heart. Um, and, and here's what he says, a famous parable. You know this. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye or the beam or plank, other translation. You hypocrite, he's saying to us. First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. He's, he's noting the absurdity of trying to judge another person while ignoring your own faults. And, and here's the analogy. You've got this giant log in your eye. You're trying to take a speck out of another eye. You can't see clearly. You cannot see clearly until you step back, take an assessment of yourself. Now, nobody wants somebody coming at their eye and trying to take a speck out of their eye, right? Now, he doesn't, watch this, he doesn't say don't take the speck out. He's saying th there's a way to do it, but the first thing you must do, the best way to judge someone else's sin is to let God's judgment come to you and do an assessment on your own sin. We, we've said it before, we, we often hear... Um, Love the sinner, hate the sin. Jesus here, he says, no, hate your own sin. And there's another full stop. Stop, assess yourself. See, choosing not to judge another person is an act of faith, isn't it? Because you're really saying, God is judge. He really is the judge over my life and every other person on the planet. And so here's what happens. This is interesting. Hit me this week because it's happened um, even in my own life. If you take time, if you pause to assess the sin in your own life, you might just realize I am in no position to judge that brother or sister or that other person. And you might end up saying nothing at all. If you step back, confess your sin and say, I'm going to let God be the judge. And watch this, I'm gonna let my life speak for itself. Sometimes that's the way we're to go. Now, if you're with me, you're tracking with me, you're thinking, but aren't we supposed to speak the truth in love? And we are supposed to do that. Primarily, those commands are for us in the body. And what happens too often, as we'll see here in a moment, Jesus speaks to this. We find ourselves trying to force our beliefs on other people. So this is the third point I want you to see. There's a commandment, there's an assessment, but finally there's a discernment. And this is where those of us who are filled with the Spirit are guided by His Spirit in every situation. Look at this, another famous uh, word picture here. He offers a little parable in verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, it's worthy to note here, um, he warns us that, that we're talking about sharing wisdom with those who will not appreciate it. And, and the dogs that he's referencing here, these are not playful golden doodles. These are not designer dogs. These dogs, some of us have seen them, you know, I call them third world dogs. These dogs will take your hand off. And they're traveling in packs during Jesus' day. And then he says, don't throw pearls before swine. They can't appreciate the value. They don't know what you're talking about. And we see this in, in the public sphere, I think at times, of Christians trying to force their views or beliefs on other people. I've talked about this before. You know, we, we see some who are demanding that we put the Ten Commandments up in public spaces. Now, I'm all for the Ten Commandments. But would Jesus, he might, he might say pearls before swine. How about live out the Ten Commandments? And, and I've noted too, I've never seen anyone, any Christians arguing to put the Beatitudes up in public spaces. That's, that's a different way to go altogether. And to live that out. This is what Jesus is saying to us. 
We're to have, an, have, a, have a discernment that, that comes from his, his spirit. And, and a word to, to parents even, regardless of how old your kids are, we, we, we struggle to force our beliefs on our children. And I'll say this, when they're younger, I know it was the case for Stacy and I in our family. Now you can imagine uh, as a pastor. So, but for you, um, it's this. As long as you're living under my roof, we go to church on Sunday morning. It's what we do. Now here's where the disconnect comes. When the parents aren't living out their faith. Then there's a real disconnect with, wait, my parents act a certain way. I hear certain things at church, but I don't see it at home. And all of us fail at some point there. But we've said it before, rules without relationship breed rebellion in a child. And I think Jesus would, would have a word for us, even those of us older, with older kids. I've talked to so many of us in our church who, who have a burden for your adult children who are no longer following the Lord or aren't, aren't believers, don't, don't follow Jesus. And, and we, we, we struggle then, how much can I say or not say? And it takes discernment, doesn't it? It takes prayer, but it first takes love. When we speak the truth in love, often we kind of leave love behind. And so the Lord is saying, hey, be really careful. See, to be a dog or a pig in his day, that was, that was a great insult in Jesus' culture. But, but he's not degrading people. He's speaking to believers. It's an analogy here. He's talking to God's people. He's warning us, don't waste your time or invite harassment from those who will obviously be hostile. That takes discernment, doesn't it? If you see a wild dog, don't go agitate it. I'm reminded of George Bernard Shaw, his famous quote, you may have heard, never wrestle with a pig, you both get dirty and the pig likes it. <laughs> we see Christians don't enter into that stuff. We trust the Lord as the great judge. Yes, we speak the truth, but you don't have to jump into every issue. You don't have to offer an opinion about every issue. You don't have to be right or argue every point. You really don't. You can just, and some of us need to release that to the Lord. God is the ultimate judge and he is the one. So it is an act of faith again to say, you know what? I'm just gonna love this person. There's a lot I wanna say. He's the defender. Stay positive, even this week and throughout your life. Stay positive, optimistic, and negativism can't touch you. The negative people around you can't touch you. Just out love them. One of the, the great um, aspects of our sanctification is that we become the most optimistic people on the planet. And let me just offer this word for us today. When I think about saying what we shouldn't say or entering into conversation, if you speak more boldly and, and with, with greater passion about politics than you speak about Jesus and the gospel, and you share your opinions about where you stand on this issue or that issue, and you don't share the gospel of Jesus Christ and talk about his love for other people, again, your priorities, your theology is off. We are a people who proclaim the love of Christ. That should be our lead in every conversation and everything we do. Because you see, it reveals what has really captured your heart. Is it Jesus? And his kingdom, or is it the stuff of this world? We have an opportunity, friends. We are citizens, yes, of America, but we are citizens of another kingdom. We live as kingdom people while here on this earth. But here's another just encouragement. We don't live in isolation. We don't live insulated lives and then just throwing our opinions at people. We, we enter into relationships with people, with, even those we disagree with. And as the, the holidays approach, we know that that can happen. The crazy uncle will be present at the table and we're gonna love him. We're gonna just talk about Jesus and how he's changed our lives. There's a way to live above it all and experience joy in the midst of a challenging season in the life of our, 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 our nation. So our focus, I'll say it this as, as I close, I'll say it this way, our, our focus as a church family for the next 85 years will be a focus on the great commandment and the great commission. We will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we will 
we will share the gospel with every person. That's what we're all about. A church that's not making disciples is not the church that Jesus envisioned. And we are white hot focused, I believe more than we've ever been on the cross, on what Christ has done for us and all of our ministries aligning together in collaboration to share the gospel with others. And we will continue to partner with amazing partners we have around our city to care for the least of these among us. Many of you are serving at Jack Lowe Elementary. Some of you are in South Dallas or East Dallas. Many of you are serving on mission trips all around the world. And I just challenge all of us to be involved. And through your giving, through your commitment to, to one another, if you're not a member of the church today, let this be the day. Let it mark this historic day as the day you join us. If you've not received Christ, today is your day. If you're not in a connect group, you need to get in a group because we cannot live this kind of life alone. We need each other. And it starts here by loving each other, even those who are different than we are here, even in our own church family. We'll continue to partner with our, our Texas Baptist, our state convention, which is so strong and so solid now with incredible leadership as we focus on the great commandment, the great commission. You know this, Christ centers us. Scripture will continue to guide us. Uh, serving defines us. We've said cultural engagement like this compels us that we're talking about today. And God's glory drives us in everything we do. Not to us, but to his glory do we live these lives. But as we close our time and share in the Lord's Supper today, I want us to set our hearts on him. And I want you to be reminded today you don't have to condemn others because Christ has been condemned for us. We don't have to, to judge others. He's already taken upon himself the judgment that should have come to us. Because you see, forgiven people forgive people. Those who are still under the judgment of God, they judge others. Those of us who've received Christ, we love as he loves us. Remember Romans 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And for some of us, self-condemnation needs to end in our lives today. Because you have been set free. There is no judgment. We are the ones who were guilty but Christ took upon himself our guilt. We're the ones who deserve the punishment, but he took it upon himself. Set free and joy-filled because of his love for us, we can love others without any need for love in return. We don't have to tear each other apart. He was torn apart for us. And so we are set free to love. We, 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 we go back to shame people. We, we dehumanize people. He was shamed for us. He was dehumanized. He was disregarded. We seek to destroy the other that we disagree with. He was destroyed for us and took upon himself his body. He took upon death himself so that we could live. He was buried and he rose again so that we too might live in resurrected power. We can live like this. We can trust him to be the judge. We can love in ways that confound people. And it's when it's really hard, Jesus teaches us here, when it's really dark, that's when the light shines the brightest. And so now I want us to, to close our time as we approach the Lord's Supper. I don't know how many hundreds of times our church family has gathered to partake of the Lord's Supper together, but today we get to do it again. And so let's all just bow our heads and close our eyes. Would you do that? And what I want to do is now enter into a time of prayer. Do you know the Lord Jesus today? Have you received his grace? And can you settle it today? Can you know that you know that you know that you trust in him, that you give your life to him. He's died on the cross for you so that you could receive his gift of grace by faith. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to be smart enough. You don't have to know enough. You just come to him by faith and say, Lord, here I am. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry for trying to be God of my life. I bow before you and I give you my life. And as the Spirit has spoken to you, before we partake of the Lord's Supper, to confess your sin before him. I want you to do that now in this moment. If you'll identify those that you have dehumanized or those that you're quick to judge, maybe in your own family, maybe there are people in your life and you just need to confess that to the Lord right now. And now thank him for his grace that has set you free. Thank him for the power of his spirit in you that causes you, empowers you, prompts you to live this way. Pray that you will be a light this week and in the days to come. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have set us free. And we can celebrate that today because your body was broken for us. Your blood was shed for us. It is finished. We are free to live for you. And it's in your name we pray. Everyone said amen and amen.